Good evening. Welcome to the April 23rd meeting of the Edina Planning Commission. My name is Kem Potts. I'm sitting in tonight for our uh, chair, Kevin Staunton. And with that, Jackie, would you call roll, please? Here. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, next up is approval of the meeting agenda, and I think uh, welcome to the, the crowd tonight. It's nice to see the room uh, well filled with people. Uh, I just want to point out ahead of time on the uh, agenda tonight, we've got two sketch plan reviews, one discussion of a, a future zoning ordinance amendment or potential of one, and then a report uh, on a tree preservation ordinance we've been working on. So. As part of sketch plan review, there is not a period for public comment, and I'll explain a little bit more about that once we get into it. But if folks were here um, with a burning question or comment, I just want to make you aware ahead of time that that's uh, not part of sketch plan review. So having said that, uh, I'll accept a motion to approve the meeting agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Say aye. aye. Opposed? Moving on to the uh, consent agenda, we've just got minutes from the April 9th Planning Commission meeting on the cons consent agenda. Uh, I've got one, one thing to point out on um, the motion for the project proposed for Xerxes Avenue. I was put down as having voted aye and as having abstaining. So that's some some trickery. Okay, thank you. It'd be cool to pull pull off, but I couldn't do it, so I yeah I had recused myself from that. Thank you, Jackie. Um, any other comments on the last meeting notes? Yes, Commissioner. I move Carr. approval of the uh, consent agenda. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, moving on to community comment period. Uh, if anybody is here for a topic that is not on this evening's uh, agenda, this is the time to come up and make those comments. You'll have three minutes to speak. And th this is for items which are not on tonight's agenda or uh, within the last 30 days. Would anyone wish to make a community comment? Okay, having said that, I'll take a motion to close community comment period. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. On to reports and recommendations then. Uh, the first of our sketch plan reviews, and while Carrie steps up, uh, I'll just mention that a sketch plan review is a fairly new tool we've been using. It's an opportunity for a group to come in uh, for a project that needs some sort of variance or alternative uh, approach than what's on part of our typical development process. And it gives them a chance to, to share those ideas and get feedback without having to go through, through a full-blown study that includes uh, architecture, engineering, traffic counts, um, those sorts of things. And so it's a chance for commission to take that in, discuss it, and also um, provide feedback to council who is watching as well as to the uh, applicants. So Carrie, first up please on West 66th. Hey, thank you, Chair, members of the Planning Commission. This first of two sketch plans, this property is located uh, just north of the Southdale Center on 66th. It's the old TCF, well not old, it's the existing TCF uh, bank building there on 66th. The site is zoned POD1, planned office district. You can see it here. It's uh, this site here, surrounded on all sides by uh, that same POD office zoning. This site is the uh, has a height overlay of up to 12 stories. So being in the Southdale area, this is an area that the city council identified in the comprehensive plan as being able to uh, sustain some more dense development. So again, 12 stories is the maximum height on this site. The site is guided in the comprehensive plan for regional medical use. Within that, as you recall, as part of the 6500 France uh, project that was approved oh, about a year ago, um, 
within the regional medical district, senior housing is now allowed, but it's the only type of housing allowed within that district. So what the applicant would need would be an amendment to the comprehensive plan. I'll get into the details of that in a minute. This area is also highlighted in our comprehensive plan as a potential area of change. And within the comprehensive plan as a potential area of change, any time that an applicant requests a rezoning of property within that area, the city council has to determine if a, if a small area plan is needed or not. So with this, when the sketch plan goes to the city council, we would ask uh, that they consider that and either require a small area plan or um, allow them to proceed. So that might be something that the Planning Commission wants to discuss as well. So what the applicant is proposing here is to remodel the existing bank building so it would remain a two-story building. You can see on the left-hand side of the screen would be the existing building, and then they would be build an addition off of uh, the north. They would remodel the inside uh, for 39, that would, that would contain 39 units of small studio type apartments, and it would be housing for young adults who have experienced homelessness. A couple of renderings of what the building would look like, and I'll let the applicant go into a little more detail on that. So this is a layout of the, uh, the site plan. You can see the studio apartments on the first level. The, the size of the units would be between 350 and 450, uh, so they would be small studio type apartments. You see there would be a, a community room, a project manager. It would be a 24-hour security building. And again, the applicant will go into more detail of the, of the use. This is a quick rendering of the second level. It shows, again, the apartments. The lower level would contain a workout room, laundry area, and a few uh, housing units down there as well. So to accommodate this request, they would need a rezoning from the planned office district to planned unit development. So again, in the office district, housing is not allowed. A comprehensive guide plan amendment that would allow other type of housing besides senior. So those two items would be required. A quick look at the site plan itself. A couple of issues uh, to discuss and some concerns that staff might have is uh, first in, in regard to parking. Um, if this were a, a typical um, apartment type, any age uh, type facility, uh, one enclosed parking stall would be needed for each unit. There's no enclosed parking here. They would simply rely on the 25 uh, parking stalls that they're showing on the north side of the property here. They are indicating a, 30, a potential of up to 33 stalls with the proof of parking in this green area here. So it would be a slight expansion. Uh, what they've indicated in their narrative is that about 16% of the residents would utilize cars or would have cars. They, their primary, primary transportation would be um, Metro Transit. And as you recall, there's the Metro Transit station on Southdale right across the street. So it would be a convenient location for that. Um, <clears throat> should this be a zoning that the city seeks, as part of the PUD, we could talk about um, should this not be successful in the future, that it couldn't be um, repurposed for all-age type of uh, housing without reconciling that parking issue. But that's something that we can get into uh, later should a formal application be made. The second issue, again, is with the, with the land use itself or the comprehensive plan issues that we have. So again, it is guided regional medical district. So if this is a one way to amend the comprehensive plan, just throwing this out as a suggestion for consideration of the of the planning commission, was we could we could provide a specialty housing provision, where on a case by case basis the city could approve certain types of housing that are identified as a need within our comprehensive plan. Each of these 39 units would be considered affordable housing, which is a need that's highlighted in our comprehensive plan within the city. So that would be one way to uh, allow this type of use uh, within this district. Just to quickly uh, show some of the, the regional medical zoning standards, the only variance that would be, aside from reconciling the whole use, uh, the only um, issues that we would have would be minimum lot size in a regional medical district is 10 acres, so they would need a variance there. Uh, and then the, uh, the parking stalls that I did touch on. 
So with that, I will stop and answer any questions that, that you may have. Otherwise, Beacon is here and to uh, make a presentation to the Planning Commission as well. All right. Thank you. Planner Teague, any questions? Commissioner Carr? Uh, could you, where did you come up with the um, concept of specialty housing? Just curious if you drew that from other ordinances or? I did not draw that from uh, other ordinances, just something that I, I thought of that, that, that we could consider. It, it would allow a little flexibility. Uh, yeah, I just, and this may not be the appropriate forum to talk about that, but I just, I would, uh, instead of may include, I would probably recommend is limited to a housing need. Otherwise, I think that term could be too broadly uh, interpreted, so I would yep, good point. have it be limited to a housing need identified in the plan. Thank you. Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Forrest. Uh, could you clarify for all of us, including the people who are otherwise observing this, the fact that the, the comp plan has it as uh, guided for regional medical, but it's currently not zoned for that. It's zoned POD. So if I'm wondering if, if somebody wanted to come in, make some changes to the building, and use it for another POD uh, use, they could do that. They wouldn't have to switch to a medical or fall into that medical description. Is that That's correct? That's correct. Yep. As long as it was something that was already allowed in POD. Correct. Okay. But... Um, but if things were to change in general, if it's guided for regional medical, our goal is to eventually zone it that way? Or how, how does that work? Because it's such a small parcel. Yeah, within this area, much of it is zoned for office, which is a, an allowed use within that regional medical district. Uh, yeah, you can see the zoning here. The area in green, that is property that's zoned regional medical, but the area in this orangish color, that is the, the planned office district. And that is a use that's allowed in the, in the regional medical district as well. It's just a little confusing because the, the regional medical and the RMD zoning are two different beasts. Right. So, thank you. Other questions? Uh, I've got one uh, back to Commissioner Carr's comment about uh, modifying the description of land use. That seems like a, an interesting and a, a good way to move forward with this based on discussions. Uh, are there any others? If, if the commission and the council like the idea and want to proceed, what else is out there for tools? Any, oh, uh, um, one thought would be you could just allow any type of housing um, within the regional medical district as well. That, that opens it up uh, much more broadly I thought this would be a way that we could really um, seek to achieve some of the housing needs that the city has, but that would be another option. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Olson. Quick one. Um, so is this type of housing mentioned as a need in our comprehensive plan? The affordable housing piece Perfect. is mentioned Sorry. as a housing need, yes. So, okay. So that would cover. Okay, cool. Yep. Oh, uh, Planner T, could you... Uh, Remind us of the, the big picture up to 2020 affordable housing goals we have. Oh, certainly. Um, the, the city, as with all cities within the, the metropolitan area, enter into an agreement with the Metropolitan Council to achieve certain affordable housing goals to achieve region-wide. And the city of Edina's goal is 212 units uh, by that 2020 uh, time frame. So we're not quite there yet. This would be a, a project that would help us get there. Thank you. Commissioner Carr? I had one other question on the parking. If only 16% of the residents are going to have vehicles, and then there's a certain amount of staff, it appears, that will be there, uh, the parking seems to, there seems to be more parking spaces than are needed. Is that correct? <clears throat> a slight increase. The, with the 25 stalls, they would be um, overparked for what they're indicating that they're that they're needing. I think the range was around 15 that they would anticipate, but that allows them to have a, a little bit extra. But you're saying if, based on the projected needs, 15 parking spots would be re needed, or? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, if we went with our traditional um, housing standard, they would need 39 enclosed spaces plus surface 
parking for, for visitors. We don't define that specific number, but they would need to provide some surface parking. But it's the 39 enclosed spaces that they do not have. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Planner T? Okay, thank you. And we have an applicant to make a presentation. Welcome, if you would uh, state your name and address, please. And if you'll be presenting with the overhead, I think you'll need a handheld mic, otherwise either of the two side mics are live. Um, my, our architect will, will join, uh, join me in a minute, but I'm Lee Blondes. I'm the executive director of Beacon Interfaith Housing Collaborative, and our offices are at 2610 University Avenue in St. Paul. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to share with you the vision for 66 West. Beacon Interfaith Housing Collaborative is an organization that believes in the power of home. We are a collaborative of congregations, and here with us today are members of Edina Community Lutheran Church, which is the lead uh, partner congregation with us, uh, working to help create this housing uh, in the community. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Beacon, um, some of you may be aware of our work through Families Moving Forward. There's a number of uh, Dinah congregations that participate in our program that helps move families from homelessness to home. Uh, Colonial Church, Dinah Community, Lutheran Church, Christ Presbyterian, Good Samaritan, United Methodist, to name a few um, of, of your participating congregations. So we feel like we have a presence here in your community and are really excited uh, to now have an opportunity to develop housing uh, for young people. Uh, we do have technical expertise in our organization. We, we have developed 500 apartments, uh, 15 apartment buildings uh, already. And um, uh, with me is our Director of Housing Development, Matt Crellin, and our Project Manager, Sarah Larson. Uh, so we have that expertise to work with our architects and contractors. Uh, we have expertise in terms of public and private financing to develop an apartment building, uh, such as we're presenting to you today. 66 West has really come from a concept of Nicollet Square, which is very similar to, which is the project that we've developed that's similar to this in Minneapolis. Um, if I can share from a Dinah Community Lutheran Church's point of view, they'll, they'll say that they had gotten excited about helping homeless young people um, and wanted to really do something and imagine that they would collect toiletries. Uh, and they walked through Nicollet Square, and one of the things I say when anyone walks through Nicollet Square is we're always looking for partners, uh, new congregations that would work with us to create housing. So they walked away with that and came back and became committed to help create a $9 million apartment building uh, by partnering with us and inviting other people in the community to be a part of this. Um, just for those of you who don't know, in nonprofit housing development often happens a little bit backwards from uh, for-profit development. Um, we actually acquire the site, uh, go through the land use approval, and then we go secure the financing to actually make it happen. So this is the beginning of the process for us, and we would expect that this could take two to three years um, for us to pull all of those resources together to actually make this project happen, with your support, of course. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who um, might be surprised, there are young people who are homeless in the suburbs. Uh, really, without stable housing, many of them might not even label themselves as homeless. Um, they might be sleeping on your couch, they're at a friend's house, um, but they're moving um, uh, from time to time uh, without a place to be able to launch a new life. And so uh, 66 West is really about providing that studio apartment, that safe, affordable place for a young person to be able to get a start in life. We expect that a lot of the young people who move in will have little or no income, um, and that's where our supportive services are so important. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on education and employment uh, so that young people can become self-sufficient while they're living at 66 West uh, and then be able to transition into the community. And one of the things that we've learned is how important it is that suburban young kids don't want to have to go into the city to receive services, but really want to stay connected to their friends and family uh, that are in the community. And so uh, we think that this is a wonderful location um, it's right there in terms of an employment center. Uh, regional medical is great for us to think about the jobs at Southdale. I just learned Southdale hires 15 to 20 people a month um, at the hospital, and many of those are, in fact, entry-level positions. Uh, Southdale itself, uh, the services at the library and the government center and the YMCA, um, and, of course, the transportation hub across the street. So uh, we're really hopeful that you'll uh, consider this location a, a good place for this housing in your community and look forward to working with you um, as we go forward. And with that, let me turn it over to our architect to talk more details. Thank you, Ms. Blunt. Good evening. I'm Bart Nelson with Urban Works Architecture. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to briefly go through 
uh, the drawings and then answer any questions you might have about the building itself. Uh, some of the things that Carrie was talking about, I'll just show the aerial because it, it does uh, show definitely the proximity to Southdale and to Metro Transit. There is a Metro Transit stop right at the corner and then there's also access across 66 to Southdale itself, as Lee was saying, jobs and opportunity there, but also the transit stations. So if, they, uh, if the residents do need to go further afield to find work, they can do that easily. Um, you also notice that there's quite a bit of parking everywhere that you can see on the aerial. Um, if you go to the actual landscape plan, uh, one of the things that's important to the residents, we feel, is exposure to south light. Uh, and so our landscape architect has made a plaza on the south side. North is up on this, this plan. And uh, we've moved the parking to the north side. And the connection between the parking and the front door, which would be here, uh, is very well landscaped. Um, Carrie also mentioned the proof of parking, which I think is very important. Um, the 25 stalls that we show here could be revised to show uh, 33, which would have an inlet here and an outlet here onto Barry. The front door of the building comes off of Barry Road, and we'd enter through a vestibule, and the effect is that you're drawn into the community room, which expands out into the plaza on the south side. So the light yellow is the community room, the dark yellow are the offices, and the blue is the are the studios for the residents. We're also showing a computer lab uh, on the corner where, and there will also be an employment specialist associated with that computer lab, so residents will be getting trained at, at that location. Another thing to show is the underground stormwater infiltration system, which we're showing as a dashed line uh, on the top of the page here. Um, Again, second floor level, uh, pink is, is a conference room and multi-purpose rooms, and studios are in blue. Lower level is studios again. There are three down there, a central laundry workroom, and uh, Nick's Closet, which accepts the donations for food and, or for clothing for the residents. Uh, if we get to the elevations, I think, the, I think you're probably all familiar with TCF and the very colonial look it has. And uh, we were trying to come up with something that is a little more attractive to youth and a little more contemporary, and something that also maybe integrates a little better with the offices that surround this, this site. Uh, so on this elevation, which is the west elevation, which would be off of Berry Road, uh, to the right, the light-colored brick is the existing building, and the idea is that we're trying to create a cornice that kind of ties the two, the addition and the existing building together and then uh, we feed off of that with the, with the rhythm of the windows and the introduction of a dark brick at the addition with some accents of a uh, metal panel. Um, also showing the landscaping that would come from the left, which is the parking lot, to the front door, which is at the center with the canopy. East side is the side that is facing, is basically a, a flat wall or the addition is aligned with the east wall of, of the existing building. Still trying to break it up with the metal panel and um, creating that cornice that has a sort of a contemporary feel to it. Um, north elevation is probably the elevation most people will see as they enter from the parking lot. Um, they'll come upon the landscaped area and the walk alongside the landscaped area to the entry canopy. Uh, again, with the uh, the metal and the, uh, the dark brick and the different colors of metal panel breaking up the facade and I think it, it, uh, it creates a welcoming uh, look to the north side. The south side uh, elevation does not show the fence that we're, we're uh, planning on um, putting up. So it'll be landscaped and then a fence to create more of a, an intimate uh, courtyard on the south side um, where the community room would, would have access to the plaza. Um, with that, are there any questions about the building itself? Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, questions? Commissioner Carr? Well, I will compliment you on the design. It looks great. Thank um, you. I, I had a few questions. I, I don't know if you have any uh, plans for bike racks there. I didn't see any, but again, if the 
residents don't all drive, they might want a bicycle, and we're mm -hmm. trying to encourage that in the city? That's an excellent point, yeah. There, there will be plans for um, bike racks, and the thought is that they're probably going to be on the back side on the north side near the parking lot. And then your other comment uh, on the fence, what kind of material is that going to be? Because it's hard to tell whether there's a fence there. It looks like a patio, or is that the fence? Yeah, okay. the fence is right up against the lighter colored trees right now, and uh, the, our landscape architect is pr proposing a cedar fence, something that has a natural look to it. Okay, and again, that's the side that faces... Yeah, that faces 66th South Street. 66th Street. Yeah. Uh, the cedar fence just off the top of my head doesn't sound like it fits in with the other buildings that might be there. I would just ask you maybe to consider some other materials. Um, I like what you've done with the contemporary look of the building and the metal sheeting. I don't know if what other materials would work. A stone certainly is popular. Mm -hmm. The stone that's used in Edina. Um, other thing, I would just ask you to consider something that maybe is a little more attractive uh, from that 60, West 66th Street. Sure, that's, that's a good observation, yeah. Commissioner Forrest? Um, on the fence, my one concern is by blocking off that south side, you're, blo you're uh, creating a barrier between the building and the street, and we're trying to encourage interaction between the pedestrian uh, traffic and the building. So mm -hmm. uh, just a comment for your consideration. And um, regarding the parking and general retrofitting the building, I, I really compliment the fact that we're reusing a building. We're not just tearing it down and building something new. I think that's great. Uh, but part of sustainability is making sure that if the use changes, that it can be adapted to other future uses. So mm -hmm. uh, when you come before us the next time, you know, if you have any comments on that, that would be great. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. I, I think I'll just add to that. I think this, this has the potential to be a, a very intriguing story, a really excellent story, um, not just of, of achieving some um, goals of, uh, of assisting the homeless youth or formerly homeless, homeless youth that you're serving, but also get the, the building reuse and then going on. Um, you mentioned a few other sustainable sustainably based approaches, um, offering the proof of parking instead of just paving it. We've been supporting that uh, a great deal, and I guess I would even encourage you to think about what, what the right number is. Could you open up even a little more green space for outdoor use of the residents rather than have unused uh, parking spots there? Mm -hmm. uh, and you, uh, along with that idea of impervious surface, I think the entire site is paved currently, except for a small front lawn, if, That's right. if I recall. So you're already creating more pervious area. Yes, uh, that's right. Than, than exists currently. So I would encourage you to also consider some other uh, some other strategies, which, which uh, I'm sure you're thinking about already in terms of um, controlling costs. I'm not sure how the organization funds operational costs of, of a building like this, but to consider an energy efficiency measures and how you're going to retrofit the existing exterior envelope as well as uh -huh. do the new addition. Yeah. Good um, points. Yes. Certainly when, uh, when you come back. So uh, those are my points. Commissioner Schroeder? Well, I'll echo uh, a couple of comments that have been made, but I want to start with a different place. The, the, um, in the proof of parking, I think you get up to 33 spaces. And I'm not sure why you'd actually need to have two accesses on the Berry Road for 33 spaces. It seems yes. really too much. And mm -hmm. if you took that access out, you might get 35 or 36 spaces. Yep. Um, and given the patterns of use here, I don't think that a um, that another kind of dead end parking bay would be detrimental to the to the project. Um, I, I want to go back to kind of the things people were talking about to, uh, relative to the fence and the south, south elevation and the adjacencies to 66th Street. We are working hard with projects all around the South Dead area to create better engagement between the buildings and the street, even in residential uh, properties. Um, and one of the things that the fence does is it limits that. Um, and I think we would appreciate a little more attention to the inter interaction between the South Building facade um, and the experience along 66th Street. You talked about the North Elevation being the elevation most people will see in the in the drawings. It's dynamic, it's interesting, 
and it's everything that the south elevation isn't. Mm -hmm. And I understand it's an existing elevation, but it also has some interesting uses on the inside that might be better expressed through some simple changes in the south facade. So I think a more expressive south facade, even though it's not the entry, uh, would be uh, um, appreciated. Um, and I think that carries through into how the, the fence or the, the kind of needed separation between the street and the, the uh, gathering space on the south side happens. Um, I don't know that it needs to be a fence. I understand the need for separation, but I just see the fence as being kind of, uh, not kind of contrary, very contrary to what we're trying to achieve in other parts of the Southdale district. I think the only other thing I would look at, and it gets away from the building design, um, and I'm, I, I, I like this project and I like what, what the goals of the project are, um, but we are applying this in a district that's defined for, as the regional medical district. And to the extent that we um, don't allow this property to evolve to something that's supportive and complementary to the, the core uses in the regional medical district, we limit the opportunities of the regional medical district to fulfill its role, not only in the community, but in the region. Um, we don't know how much or how far the regional medical district will ever expand. Um, we've had proposals come before us that have suggested um, other kinds of uses in that proximity some oriented towards senior housing, but they started as medical facilities. We don't know where that's going to go. So I think for us, we need to consider if we allow this to happen here and we invest in this building, does it limit us in terms of what we might want to do for the community in the long term with the regional medical district? It's a good use. We like it. it, it a lot, the, the activities that you're proposing to put in the building align with the goals of our comprehensive plan but we're, we may also be limiting some of the other goals of our comprehensive plan that are oriented towards um, supporting this area as a regional medical district. Commissioner Lee. I just had a question, a general question about the basement level. Did you mention there were three studio units down on the lower level? Yes. Uh, do they have windows or how does that work? Uh, they have, yes, it'll be, um, an area well which shows up on the west elevation. Um, there are four windows down there, uh, one for each of the studios and one for a common space. Um, landscape architect is suggesting tiering down from, it basically slopes a little to the west from the building. It slopes about three feet, I believe it is. And so you tear down to those windows inside that area well, which would be landscaped, landscaped area well. Okay, and I, uh, I, actually, I agree with uh, Commissioner Schroeder that the south elevation, mm -hmm. I think, really needs, could use a little more attention. Um, although, uh, given the fact that that is your main source of light and uh, an emphasis, it, it really uh, doesn't quite carry the same weight as the north elevation. I think it's that the north elevation is an interesting um, maybe more of that type of thing can be done on the south elevation. And then in the landscape plan, um, you had mentioned, uh, maybe I missed this, is that a patio area that you're going to have? Are there outdoor areas for these, the residents to go? Yes. On the landscape to? plan, the sort of arced area, paved surface, would have grills and tables to sit on. And there's a smaller uh, area, landscape area, uh, on the north side of the building. Kind well. of a courtyard? Yeah. So perhaps maybe it's not so much of a fence as just some type of uh, landscape screening that mm -hmm. could be, be provided there mm -hmm. um, might accomplish something. I think the more green we can have there would, would s certainly help. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Good suggestions. We'll work on those when we come back. Other questions? Commissioner Kilbert. Um, you may not be the one to answer this question, but maybe um, the applicant or um, someone you have here, but I was just wondering or curious if you had had any contact with the neighboring um, properties or the management of those buildings and had gotten any feedback regarding bringing a residential use into the area where it's primary, primarily office. Have you had those conversations or are those planned for the future? I'll hand the mic over. 
Hi, Sarah Larson. Uh, we have contacted a number of uh, community residents and community neighbors, uh, particularly I know we've had a conversation, there's a nearby condo association in the back. I think the condo president is who we met with and their response was positive. We outreached to the adjacent business owner, to the writer and management company. Uh, their reaction was neutral or they supported the use. We didn't have a further conversation with them. We, we have, we have put a message into Southdale to ask their feedback. We have not heard back from them, but we hope to continue those conversations. We've also talked to Fairview Hospital, the president, about the project, and they're not immediately adjacent, but obviously very nearby, and he was supportive of the use and the change as well, uh, as well as various other community leaders and business leaders who own property or have interests in the greater Southdale area. Thus far, we haven't received any concerns or negative comments about the proposed use. All right, thank you. Oh, Ms. Larson, could, uh, while, while you're up, uh, I, th I think I've got a question you may be able to answer as well. Could you discuss a little bit how people move out from this housing project? And, and what I'm asking about is the, um, it seems like an, an interesting model of creating sort of workforce housing. There are many job opportunities you know, surrounding the area. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, what causes someone to, to leave? We know what, what brings them here. Well, I think I'm probably going to let Lee speak just because she handles the service side a little sure. bit more okay, closely than you. I do. Sarah's our real estate expert. Um, uh, so at, at Nick Litzker, we don't actually know. We're still in the process of putting our funding together, and so some of that will determine what kind of services and exactly what the rent structure will be. At Nicollet Square, one of the things we've done is actually had a tiered rent structure. So the rent is 200 when people move in, and then it goes up to 300 after two years, and then up to 400 uh, in the fourth year, so that we're kind of slowly nudging people out. Uh, the general length of stay has been about one to two years. Um, so that is what we would generally expect because there's services and there's some rules like young people everywhere um, they're ready for the full independence that they would have in an apartment building um, or um, wanting to move in with a boyfriend or a girlfriend um, this is single occupancy and so those are uh, things that will lead people to move on with their lives um, and and then choose to move out into the community and and so and uh, and also to add excuse me our services are designed then to help find that housing um, and help make that transition happen can you just, I'm just curious, uh, what's the typical age range of your residents? <clears throat> um, so most of the young people are about 18 and 19. Uh, 19 has been the most common um, at Nicollet Square. Um, what we find is a lot of young people are, um, when they're homeless, when they're younger, really are looking to stay invisible. And it's actually hard to find young people. At 18, when they're of age, um, they're suddenly surfacing. And so it's really trying to catch them really as young as possible uh, so that we can help them transition um, and connect to adult services and, and into education and employment. Great. Thank you. Uh, other questions? I think uh, as a way to wrap up this... Um, does sound like a, a project that complements a lot of what, what's going on around it. Um, Good to be mindful of, of master planning ideas for uh, regional medical. I'm, I'm not familiar with how broadly those may grow. I think, however, this does, uh, in, in the column of what supports this project in my mind, is it's a way to add density without adding traffic burdens that we're always wrestling with as we uh, look at things like that. So with that, we will um, close that sketch plan review. Thank you, and um, these notes will go on to council. Next up, Carrie, um, 7151 York, another sketch plan review. Okay, thank you, Chair, members of the Commission. This site, located down in the northeast corner of the city, in the south, of, south side of the Southdale area. Property is currently zoned uh, senior residential. It's the existing 12-story uh, Yorktown Continental building. Some of you on the Commission may recall, about a year ago we saw a sketch plan proposal um, to build a four-story um, addition to this building on the other side, on the east side of the building. The applicant, um, this is actually a different applicant, um, 
is proposing to locate a four-story building on the west side. And I believe that was suggested by one of our commissioners, Commissioner Schroeder, um, <clears throat> was recommended on that previous um, proposal to flip it over to the York side and make that a little more, uh, um, engage the street more. So what they're proposing here is a 100-unit uh, senior building. It would be 70 units would be uh, senior housing with services, and 30 would be for memory care. Uh, they've also indicated that 10% of the housing units would be uh, dedicated for affordable housing. So again, achieving our affordable housing goals. A couple of renderings of what the building might look like. And again, I'll let the applicant go through that as well. Um, <clears throat> looks like metal siding um, with a brick base. Again, four stories. So look at the site plan as you see the building over on the York side uh, York Avenue side. Previous request, again, was on the east side. So they're flipping the uh, parking field to the back. Currently, the uh, density is 45 units per acre on this site. So this would increase that up to 64 units per acre. That previous request that we considered was 76 units, and this is 100. Uh, since we did that review, at that time, the comprehensive plan had a maximum density at 30 units per acre, but with that, with the amendment to the comp plan with that 6,500 France uh, housing project, uh, we did amend the uh, comprehensive plan to allow um, over 30 units an acre on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, some of the things that, that we would base that on is proximity to low density residential use, proximity to hospital, utility capacity, uh, transit availability, below grade parking, uh, sustainable design, public art, and public art. This building, again, would be separated from the low-density residential to the east in the city of Richfield, uh, so it would achieve that goal. There is adequate utilities available. Again, transit service is available in York. They are proposing below-grade parking in this instance, so all the parking uh, for this new building would be provided underneath. And again, they are providing a, an element of affordable housing. The traffic, sustainable design, and all of that would be reviewed again as part of a formal application to make sure that we uh, gain those um, things that we're looking for also in the comp plan. Um, just to quickly look at the, um, the zoning standards, again, this is a planned senior residential district. So the flexibility or the variances that would be required here is in regard to that density where the council would have to approve density over 30 un units an acre. Everything else would be code compliant. So with that, I can stand for questions. And again, the applicant is here to give a little bit more detail on the project. Questions for Planner Teague? Commissioner Olson? You could have the um, architect answer this too, but so is the parking that's shown on the site plan, is that all existing parking, that surface parking? Uh, let's see if I've got an existing. Yeah, this is the existing parking on the site. So you see there's a parking field in the front and the back. So that new parking field would be an expansion of what's behind the building now to replace that parking in the front. Okay. And then they're also going to be providing underground parking. So and there we, would be underground parking as we well. And do need to replace that surface parking? Or is that additional or is that required? Yet yeah, they're replacing that surface parking in the back and then they're providing the, uh, the underground parking to serve the new, the new facility. Okay, so it's all required? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Carr and then Commissioner Forrest. Just one question on the site plan. Uh, I don't see a, is there a sidewalk there along York Avenue South? There's not one shown, but that certainly would be something that I think we would be looking for. I mean, I for. would think we would... <laughs> have that be part of the requirement that there be a sidewalk along there and and plantings as well. Thank you. Commissioner Forrest. I'm just curious and I should have asked this before the meeting but I forgot to do so. On A4, um, page A4 of our packet, 7201 is um, outlined and I'm wondering is there a reason for that or is it, did we just uh, Long. Look at that, I circled the wrong site. That's the wrong It's parcel. one to the north. Okay, that's what <laughs> yes. I thought. I just want to make sure there Good I catch. wasn't missing something. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? 
Commissioner Lee. Carrie, this is com a completely different applicant from the previous time. It is correct. So it's it's in effect kind of being reviewed again Starting for the very for, uh, for the first time. Yep. So we kind of approach it that way. All right. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Kilbert. Um, are there any requirements or ordinances that we have to do with because the city of Richfield is on the other side of the property? Have I mean, I know we just looked at it and it's a little farther away with that community garden, but is there a height requirement facing a different, you know, a different city or anything that, that I mean, I know it's on the exact opposite side of the property, but is there anything we run into that, you know? By flipping the building over on the other side, we won't, uh, it won't be uh, so similar to the Wix project, but we don't have a specific code requirement that r increases the, the setback on a tall building, essentially, from residential property. You remember with the, the WIC site, um, we have the standard that the setback from any building that's over, um, over four stories tall has to be set back twice the height of that building. And so at 70 feet back there, they needed that 140-foot setback. So that would be something we'd look at if the building were on the, on the south side. It's not a Edina code requirement, but... Similar to the WIC site, we, we would take a look at that anyway. But having the building uh, on the west side, that wouldn't be an issue here. Commissioner Carr. Just a quick question. What is on the opposite side of this building? I don't know if that would be to the east. There is a park back here. Um, and then these are single-family homes in the city of Richfield. Okay, that's the city of Richfield. On oh, the other side, going, um, is that York Avenue? It's York Avenue? Yep, York on yeah. the west side. So, and what is the opposite, uh, what is the, on the other side of York? Do you know? Uh, just... it, it's all residential. It's all residential? Yep. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Lee? Uh, Kiri, um, back to that compliance table. So this is about 100 units that they're asking for. What, and that's, what is the maximum number of units then would, that would have been allowable? The maximum this? number of units based on the, the, um, the density requirement in the PSR 4 district is actually 102, 182 units. So they're over now. Uh, so it would require, if we stayed with that same PSR4 zoning, they would need a variance to that standard. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Planner Teague. Can we hear from the applicant? Good evening. Good um, evening. My name is Della Kulpeen, and I'm with Masaba Capital Development. We're located at 5201 Eden Avenue in Edina, Minnesota. Uh, first of all, thank you for your time this evening. Um, I know that uh, our goal tonight was to really, we're at the very conceptual stages of our project, and really our goal was to listen and learn and hear comments um, based on what was uh, presented last year to what we're presenting this year. I have with me tonight both uh, my business partner, uh, Bo Nickloff, as well as um, RSP Architects, who's been working with us on this project. And we'll present a little bit more of the architectural design and imagery um, based on our thoughts. So I want to answer a few questions that were brought up previously. The existing parking on uh, the entire parcel is 127 parking locations for the 264 apartment building. As you know, that building is going under a, a major renovation um, of the exterior skin, et cetera. I think there would, it's about a $17 million project that will be happening on that parcel. Our goal is to relocate the entry to the, to the east side at this point, and all of the parking will be more convenient to the main entry to the apartment building. We're looking at about 150 parking stalls, so there'll be an increase of parking uh, based on uh, that increased. We're also looking at all of our parking to be enclosed underground. Uh, with about 10 visitor parking um, to the south side of our entry at the Portico Share. The second thing is, is as you talked about along York Avenue, and the reason that we actually brought this option up is it 
has to do with how do we create a more urban landscape along that. So yes, you'll see imagery of what we're looking at presenting, sidewalks, uh, more landscaping, et cetera. We want to engage into York Avenue. Um, we've continued to refine our plan, you know, really since what you have in your packet. Uh, we're continuing to look at our stormwater management plan, as well as one of the other things we'd like to um, have some conversations on is with uh, Metro Transit. We'd love to have a bus stop actually at this location. Um, we feel that actually all of the residents within uh, this entire parcel, the apartment building and uh, the senior living would, it'd be a great asset. And we're looking at potentially having the bus stop being connected to our building so they don't even have to go out into the weather and how can we work with Metro Transit. Um, so. That's really a, where we're at. We're here to listen, learn. We're here to answer any questions. What I'd like to do is maybe share a few more of the imagery that we've put together um, based on what our thoughts and what we'd like to see it without putting a lot of pencil to the paper and then really gain your insights. So, Elena. Oh. How do we turn it on? Then? He's going to turn it on, he okay. said. So this image, we wanted to show that it's an urban oh, landscape. Excuse me, we, could we get your name? Oh, Elena Carter, RSP Thank Architects, you. I apologize. We want this to be an urban landscape. We've looked at the York Avenue master plan, and we are seeing that it's about a walkable community. It's about connecting people to place along that and bringing and activating that street. So this is an image that we've started to look at, a more urban downtown feel. We, the owner group liked this image, so you can see the sketches. Some metal panel, some brick. We do have the 10-story building behind us. We kind of see that as a building we want to marry with. It's going to look different, but the brick selection would be similar. Some of the, the metal that they're designing into that renovation would be similar to this, so that it doesn't look like it's totally out of context, but yet we want this building to feel like it's new and fresh and really bringing life to that city street. Um, just another image. And then here's the site plan. And this is a site plan that we've updated since the packet was presented. So you can see we've added sidewalks to that connect back to the street along with that bus stop. There is the 45-foot setback. Right now when you look at York Avenue, it's a berm with some trees on that. We would like to uh, reduce that berm and have it more walkable and connected to the street so the the windows and even patios facing York Avenue would connect with the street. One thing we understand about seniors is nobody really wants to go and sit in a beautiful landscaped area with no activity. So we want to provide activity of the street for them to look out and even to walk. There's a Cub Foods north of here. There's um, a, a CVS pharmacy or a Walgreens that they can then access and still connect to that. And your question earlier was, what is across York Avenue? There's actually a Panera Bread there. There's a strip mall. So um, providing access to other amenities is not residential. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, we are very preliminary, very conceptual, because today is about getting information from your, the, the, you, the commissioners, to understand how would you want to influence this design and make sure that it really encompasses the, the desires for the, the York plan. So some additional typology that we've looked at. This is an image. It, it's taller than what this project would be, but really you can see we have lots of windows. We're trying to activate that street again with the look. We are going to have some rooftop terraces, so up on the upper levels. Um, typically in senior design, you would put memory care on the first floor. We're going to say, let's put it up higher. They can see out on the street, but yet they're safe. We can make sure that we would have some higher walls that they could not get out of, but if they're right on the lower level, there's one door to get right onto York Avenue. And that also allows those independent living residents to be right on the street. They can then have access and, and leave their homes. Um, as well. So just some additional typology we've been looking at um, as we've been design looking at the design and moving forward. And this is in downtown Minneapolis creating that urban feel. This is, is a project that I think has been very successful with connecting to the street and really revitalizing that area in um, north, the north Minneapolis area. Um, Della, do you have any other comments? 
know, based on what you've heard from us, we'd love to hear from you, uh, and hopefully we can answer any questions that you might have and or um, get insights to how you see the project fitting into the uh, landscape of Edina. Great. Thank you, Ms. Volpine. Ms. Carter, Commissioner, questions? Commissioner Carr. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you can go back. To, you said that to one of those, the site plan, where you said that there were some sidewalks that were showing. But it, it looked like the sidewalk was right up against the street. And part of the Living Streets Advisory Group, again, to create the cityscape look, is that you generally will have a green space with the sidewalk away from it, might have trees planted in that green space, might have some benches as well to make it inviting. I don't know what kind of lighting, if that's... Uh, is part of your plan as well but it wasn't clear from that site plan and one of the things we'll want to do as we walk through this is currently there's not a sidewalk on the street and how would we tie to the north and to the south so if there's any thought into having adding sidewalk to this how would we tie into that but I think your comment to adding a boulevard area and That's landscaping exactly right. that is a great idea and yeah, I see it be having benches. It may not be straight. It may be a little meandering because we do have 45 feet of a setback. So um, there'll be a great environment. And one of the um, one of the goals of our project is really connecting to the outdoors. And as we've looked at this site plan, um, you know, we see really an opportunity to create very distinct environments. We have, you know, the streetscape along York. We have the courtyard that's interior between uh, the two buildings, which will be shared by both. There'll be parts of it that are going to be in shade because as we've looked at how the sun, you know, works, it's a perfect opportunity to create some beautiful shade gardens in there. And on the back side, as we looked at potentially rain gardens, um, you know, for our stormwater management, that we can create these different environments within this piece of this parcel of land uh, for the residents that may not go far. Um, so that's really a goal is it won't have to look the same. And so we're excited about the, those opportunities. One thing about this project that's really exciting is it's really allowing for that aging in place on one campus. So an existing building um, that a, a two people could move into, they can then move on to independent living, stay within their unit because of the way that it's designed, or move on to assisted living and then memory care. The, having that variety and that choice within one campus is so important because once somebody leaves their home and chooses to say, I'm stepping out and I'm moving to this community, to make another move at that stage in their life is very difficult. So the, it's exciting to be able to put this all on one campus. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Lee. Uh, so just to clarify, the mm -hmm. addition is the assisted memory Independent, li yes. independent living. Okay. Yes. And um, that is a right now you're proposing, could, um, and that won't change. It's, it's three. Is three stories or four? It will stories? be four, four stories. stories. We have some steps both ways, both on the sides, and then we're looking at how to step it back on the front as well. Um, as uh, Elena actually spoke to, we want to have some roof terraces um, out there. You know, even spots for people to garden on the roof terraces as well. It's actually been a great amenity that we've seen. Okay, and then one of the renderings that showed was kind of prototypical, but um, your plan actually shows it kind of undulating in back and forth on that face, so it's not a straight face. Is that correct? That's on correct. The, on the York side. Yep. That would be correct. So that is, that's the rendering for, that matches the plan? Yes. That's the preliminary elevation study that we've looked at. Again, the goal was to at least present a material and the material usage. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we have a lot, we have more work to do on the elevation study itself, but it was a step into showing you here are the materials that we are looking at. Well, I do like the idea of, of varying that front plane mm -hmm. and jogging in and out. That's, that's a very nice, nice way to handle that and get break away from that sort of strong linear focus that the existing building has. Uh, last question is, existing building has how many units and uh, how many additional units will be in the new and, portion? Uh, so the existing 12-story apart apartment building has 264. And I apologize, Mr. Teague, I had 263, but it is 264 in the existing apartment building. And we are proposing a 100-unit uh, senior uh, living project. 30 would be memory care. And then uh, 70 would be what we'd say senior housing with services. Um, and that will be a mix of independent living and assisted living. 
Thank you. you. Commissioner Kilberg. Uh, I just have a couple different questions and comments. One of them is regarding the general um, flow of pedestrians around the site, which I feel is also very important. Um, I kind of want to echo Commissioner Carr's comments about bringing the sidewalk a little bit off the street, creating kind of that feeling of more of a boulevard area, more urban. Um, I'd also like to just make a comment that um, I'm, I'm could be mistaken, but it looks like there is a sidewalk in to the site north of yours that would is that correct? And yours can yours. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, so there, there, is. there is a sidewalk and then um, so I feel like that provides a great connection to cross over York. Um, you mentioned going to the Panera and the Target. Um, there's a sidewalk that kind of goes up along there so I would do that. Um, also just another comment there is kind of an extension of the promenade that comes behind your site and um, looking at your existing building and your new building. I think it would be a great benefit to kind of have maybe a sidewalk area that extends from your building to the east side of your site east side um, because there is that promenade connection which would then again provide a residence to the promenade which goes all the way up um, along in between York and France and I feel like that'd be a great amenity for your residents um, walking and otherwise um, so I would just kind of consider that I don't know how that would work so I just want to make sure that's actually from kind of the Richfield side and the park area through the side. yeah okay I know the promenade doesn't officially start until kind of right actually a site down from yours, but it, it looks does. like there is a sidewalk connection that okay. hooks up there. And I would just kind of encourage that use because we are um, encouraging our promenade and we've seen a lot of things that are kind of changing the dynamic of the promenade um, from what it already is today. Um, also, I just have a question. Uh, will the apartment buildings have shared amenities? So are you planning with, through management that um, users of the, that would be in the senior living would share amenities with the other apartment building? Yes, and, and those are uh, early discussions. We know that the courtyard for sure will be a shared amenity between both of the buildings. They have a large uh, dining facility, I think, on their main level, and so we are looking at what are the shared things that we can. Um, but that's in early discussions as uh, we work with our operator as well. All right, and then um, just one final question, kind of similar to the one I asked the last applicant. Um, have you gotten a lot of reactions from or talked to the op occupants of the apartment building? Are they excited or are they kind of apprehensive about construction and other now, concerns? You know, I don't think they're apprehensive um, at all. And again, I think there's a lot going on in their building with the renovation that they have going on um, as well. I think there's a lot of positive knowing that they have this that's going to be on the site. So should they need to move from their very independent apartment, they're going to be close to the same, you know, it's really going to be home for them. And so there's a lot of positive uh, reaction from the tenants. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Schroeder. Well, I'm going to echo uh, some of Commissioner Kilberg's comments about creating a more connected site experience. I realize this is very preliminary, but um, you have opportunities to connect between a courtyard and in this site plan someplace some a space to the south of the building that was parking in the previous to the community gardens and, and it just seems like there needs to be more connected experience all the way through the site i understand that you're preliminary but that seems to be as we start looking at kind of the, the totality of this site and how it works with two buildings and lots of parking for a, a resident to be able to experience the the whole site becomes important and I also want to focus back on that, um, the 45-foot space. I don't like to call it a setback because it suggests there's nothing happening there. And in fact, that should really be one of the most active parts of this site mm -hmm. to make it fit with one of, the, one of our goals about activating uh, um, developments um, facing streets around the South Hill area. And while 45 feet is this, the regulatory setback, I don't know that 45 feet is actually the right size for that space to be. It might be that it's more effective at 25 or 30 feet than at 45 feet. So I'd encourage you to explore that. You're going through a process, the sketch plan process, like in the last version that this came, I suggested that they move the building to the front. Now I'm saying, if we're going to go that far and move it to the front, let's really see what that space can be. And you've suggested some interesting uh, ideas and in, in notions in some of the graphics that uh, talk about uh, a more direct relationship, almost like stoops out to the street. Stoops don't really work very well if you're 45 feet from the property line. So I'd really look at what that space can be. If the courtyard gets bigger um, because you're moving it closer, or if we have to um, look towards a variance to allow a more active side of that building, I, th I would be supportive of that. Great. That's, That's great. really encouraging, because that was, I think, what I wanted to hear tonight. Other questions? Commissioner Halva. 
Um, I had a question about the parking. Um, so did you say you were moving 150 stalls underground? We actually have uh, right around 75 to 80 stalls underground. Everything that's needed for the senior housing facility is going to be enclosed. Um, and we're actually adding a few visitor parking um, at the top by the porta cochere. The, hundred and, the 150 surface are all for the apartment okay. building, the existing one. And as you look at it, it really becomes more efficient because today when you go on that site, it's, you go all the way around all the parking. And, and so it's going to be easier for the residents to find parking and actually enter the building because now they have to go in on both sides. So, But so yes, it's 150 parking stalls. On page um, A10, then that is the plan for the parking. All of those, or are you eliminating some of those? Do you, go ahead. The, the, what we've done is we have an upgraded plan, so I don't know if you want to go through that one. Yeah, I can go through the upgraded plan. So we've actually looked at the, this is the 150 stalls. I believe the plan you have has some additional parking mm -hmm. along yeah. this property line. One thing we felt when we were meeting as a team was we really wanted to allow for green space along York. So with our building, we didn't want to have parking jammed up close to that area. So we tried to minimize it. We don't want to over park this site. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that there's a lot of green for people who aren't going to go out to other places. So the plan that you're seeing here is the revised parking plan that we're looking at. We also created a green connection through at this front this is the front entry to this building and your comments about connecting to the promenade and there's actually a park over here that's something that we definitely want to do as part of this project so I think to clarify the parking that's in your packet um, the existing apartment building has 125 or 127 27 parking stalls the new plan that we're proposing has 150, which is here. The plan that you have, I think, has more than that, like close to 200. And we felt that, we feel that that's actually more parking than that's needed on mm -hmm. this site. And we would propose that we bring it back down to the 150 and really work with Metro Transit to get our own bus stop on this site because I think that's an amenity that all of the people on the site would really, um, and I think it would be great for the, the parcel as a whole and so we are looking at reducing um, from probably what code would drive for the apartment building because they're probably they are not parked to code right now at 127 so I think that's where you got to 200 we're saying maybe let's step that back to 150 parking stalls for the apartment building yes Commissioner Halva. um sorry I had another question that's okay um what is the plan for access between the two buildings is it going to be outside or are you going to create like a passage like enclosed i know that uh in the in the previous uh submission i think a year ago there was going to be a, a sky sky link um at this point we don't see the connection of a sky link or anything we're looking at that courtyard really to be the connection between the two um and then if it is outdoors i think that will be fine we don't see um a connecting Skylink and or a building together. They're going to be two separate buildings. Okay, thank you Commissioner Carr Just one other question uh, transportation related but more physical walking transportation uh, I'm looking at the site plan and so there's York Avenue South and the target and Panera Bread Where do, are those on the opposite side of York Avenue then? Yes Okay, and have you talked to anyone at the city about how these folks are going to get across that street. I don't know, is there a place to walk across there? Is it well marked? I don't know those, the answers to that, but since you're again bringing more residential, I'd be interested to know how these elderly people who don't walk fast are going to be walking across the street and what the safety issues are. And I know that is taken into consideration in some of the work that's being done uh, on France Avenue where the uh, streets are narrowed, but the median is uh, increased in size, so people can walk across. And if they can't make it across to the light, they can stop in the middle and then wait till the light turns again. So I don't know if those things have been considered, but certainly I would recommend that. Thank you. I could comment. Just there is a crossing yes. at, um, I think, is that Hazleton? Yeah. Yes. So there's a crossing at Hazleton over 
66. <coughs> that doesn't look too far north of your site. And it does have a light there. That's the one you're talking yeah. about, correct? Yeah, correct. And, and I think sometimes it has to do with the timing of the lights, too, that maybe you actually have yeah. the walk signal a little bit longer. I mean, those are some things that we'd love to work with you on because we believe that the site is great because of all the amenities, the grocery store, the pharmacy, the library, the mall. They're all there, and it's all within walking distance. Mr. Chair, just to clarify, Commissioner Schroeder. south of this, there is an underpass that gets people past York Avenue without having to cross at street level. It's part of the promenade, and it was intended to help facilitate movement across a busy street. Mm -hmm. And it's to the parcel to the south. Thank you, Commissioner Schroeder. And is there a, a way to move northward then once you cross under? Do you know? On the west side. Or along the promenade. Sure. So this is, this is the this is the incorrect. Better turn my mic. So the site is right here. The underpass that Commissioner Schroeder was referring to is right here. Mm -hmm. So there would be a potential link if we do a sidewalk to come through this way or along the street. There's the uh, crosswalk to get across would be um, right here at Hazleton. So that would be just a short distance to come up to the stoplight and get across. So those would be the two options to get across. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Uh, Thank you. This looks like a, another very interesting project that hits on a lot of points that we're seeking in, in supporting the comprehensive plan. Um, activating the street, working with uh, Metro Transit sounds great in an effort to, to reduce parking. Um, the affordable housing units that are part of this. I think um, one thing when you do return, I'd encourage you to give us a little more on some specific sustainability strategies. We, did, we heard a few things referred to. Heard some good um, urban planning walkability things, uh, but not so much about the building itself. If there aren't any other questions, then we'll. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and look we forward, look forward to, to seeing you, you again. Thank you. Next up, uh, uh, Planner Teague is, is going to walk us through. Um, the Wix site that was a topic at the last meeting has been referred to tonight. Um, we ran into a potential uh, zoning snag with that, uh, and we're going to hear a potential solution or mean, means of dealing with that to allow projects like that to, to proceed both on this site and I think perhaps on others uh, similar to it. Yes, thank you, Chair Potts, uh, members of the commission. As you know, our current ordinance, PUD ordinance, does not allow R1 property to be considered for a PUD ordinance. Um, we had a lot of discussion when we created the PUD ordinance, so four, three, four years ago, in regard to this topic, but we did settle on not allowing the R1 properties to be included in a, in a PUD. Part of the thinking, I think, was to um, give assurances, because there was some apprehension about creating a PUD ordinance, giving some assurances to um, not rezoning the, the vast land use, uh, the vast majority of our land use in the city, you know, 80% uh, being single family. Um, so as you know, the Lennar project, 26% of that project did include properties that were uh, zoned R1. So in order for the council to consider that project, staff is recommending an ordinance revision uh, that would allow R1 properties to be considered if they're the minority um, land use within uh, the overall project. What's on the screen is um, some suggested language. So the, how that would read would be property that currently is, is zoned R1, R2, and PRD1 shall not be eligible for a PUD. That's the current language. And then we would add, unless it constitutes unless it constitutes less than 50% of the total property in the proposed PUD. I had a discussion with uh, Chair Potts a couple of days ago, and he indicated that we should take a look at how this would impact other properties in the, in the city. So I um, prepared a couple of graphics here. Where this would impact is primarily along our smaller commercial nodes. 
uh, the Grandview area, 44th in France, um, 50th in France area, where there's commercial or residential properties adjacent to commercial areas. So this first, uh, this first graphic, this is the Grandview area. So you can see the the multicolored um, uh, the multicolored sites. That's the commercial property within Grandview. The areas that are hatched here with the X's, those are properties that are zoned R2. So as an example, if this property or the property, um, these two, if these were to be proposed for a PUD, some of these R2 sites could be incorporated within that PUD. Uh, same would go for some of the single family homes that are adjacent to some of the uses along Vernon, these smaller sites. So it would be pretty, it would be limited to only a couple of sites as, as suggested in the ordinance. This is the 44th in France area. <clears throat> you can see um, we have properties that are zoned office. That's the orange and the red commercial. And we've got some R2 properties located adjacent. So those potentially could be incorporated um, should this ordinance go forward. And there's also some a couple of single family homes that could be tied to uh, the commercial property in that area. Same would go for the Valley View and Wooddale area. This is uh, Wooddale, Valley View. And we've got the, uh, the strip mall here and the old Clancy's building here. So some of these single family homes that surround this area. Again, we've got a couple of properties that are zoned for R2 duplexes that could be incorporated. This is the Southdale area. Uh, this is the new Burgundy site. We've got some properties just to the north there that are zoned for duplexes. Those could have been incorporated into a PUD. And again, adjacent to some of the uh, high density residential just west of France. This is the, the Southdale area. This graphic is, is um, somewhat interesting. So if, if you took this site here, this is the, uh, the office tower to the west of, of uh, Southdale. If this were proposed for a PUD, so technically you could incorporate some of these single family homes here. So we might wanna consider language about um, having property separated by right of way, something to consider also. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop um, and just say that public hearings have been scheduled for the Planning Commission on May 14th to consider an ordinance amendment and then with the City Council on May 20th. So the purpose for this evening is to just present this, get some feedback from Planning Commission, and then we'd come back to you at the next meeting uh, with the ordinance proposal. So with that, I'll stop and answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Planner Teague. Mm -hmm. I think um, one, one other thing worth mentioning from that conversation, I, I asked Planner Teague about the 50% threshold and um, well, you know, whether that should be up for consideration. I, I think at this point, it's sort of a first pass at what might make sense. So that may be worth talking about as well. If the intent is to protect residential districts, um, we could consider recommending 40% or 30% um, uh, to to council for this topic, uh, as well as an, an interesting idea on some of these sites to use right away as as another way um, to allow this to work, but also protect residential areas. So, having said that, uh, any questions or comments, Commissioner Kilbert? I actually have a question for um, Carrie. So, would this have a? F I don't know if you recall, but we reviewed the site right here off of Vernon for apartments to go in or. They were, huh, I don't know how we reviewed it, but um, would this have affected that if they, if we had had this ordinance saying that they could have rezoned and had a PUD? Do you feel like that would have helped the process that we went through? I know we were struggling with, you know, how to configure it, and we didn't really get all we wanted out of it. Do you feel that that would have improved the process? Because that's just one that right comes to my mind at the time that I've been here, where it it seems like we were taking single-family duplex homes and transitioning them into a different type of project. Yeah, if this ordinance were to move forward, it would allow us the opportunity, you recall, just to the east of the sites that we considered, there were some single-family homes. Mm -hmm. If the applicant purchased those, they could have been incorporated into the project. The sites that we were considering 
already had the higher density. I believe they were zoned um, PRD two or three, but the sites adjacent to it were zoned R1. Um, so with this ordinance proposal, those sites could have been considered in that project. Thank you. Commissioner Carr. I was just curious as to why, well, again, there, there's going to be an impact in other areas. I, I don't know if we've fully investigated the negative impact of that. Uh, why would you not want to just rezone this one small area and do it just on a project-specific basis rather than changing the ordinance? That would be the other option is they could first rezone it to commercial then they would have to go through, that's a two-step process, that's about a four-month process, then they would have to come back and then rezone it to PUD. Okay. So it, somewhat of a timing issue for them at this point. Okay. Commissioner Forrest? I wasn't here for the last meeting, so I wasn't in on that discussion, and, but looking through the materials, it didn't seem completely inappropriate what they were proposing to incorporate the property that those R1 homes were on. But I am concerned because when you look at the overall purpose of what was done regarding the PUD ordinance and also regarding just our zoning in general into R1, R2, or whatever, my big concern is the, the real potential of commercial creep into the residential neighborhoods. And I'm wondering if there are any other mechanisms that could be used in this situation rather than a blanket allowance of use in... Um, PUDs. I know there's advantages to having PUDs in residential areas too sometimes because it allows us as a city to, and a community to get more out of it, but I'm, I'm just very concerned about the attractiveness to developers to come in and, and look at single-family neighborhoods as potential commercial sites. And, and that's part of the reason that we took this more conservative approach that it would just be a limited amount of the R1 district that, that, that would apply rather than just opening it up citywide for consideration of PUD throughout the R1 district. Other comments? Commissioner Schroeder? I, I think the one thing that we have to remember about the PUD is that somebody applying for a PUD doesn't achieve it by right. They have to prove it. So the, the notion of commercial creep into a residential neighborhood is something that would happen because we would allow it, not because the developer wants it. Um, and the other aspect of the PUD um, that I think is important is when a PUD is proposed in every case that we've looked at with the exception of the project along 77th Street, Site plans are required that demonstrate what the condition, configuration, mass, what the, what the buildings will look like. Um, so we have a lot of control with the PUD that we, wouldn't otherwise, that we may not otherwise have in a rezoning process. So um, I think that, that to suggest that we would allow, that this would allow commercial creep into residential areas puts the focus back on us and whether we would allow that. And I think we've demonstrated through a comprehensive plan we don't want that to happen. Um, so I'm, I'm not as concerned about establishing a PUD, that uh, a, a process that allows a PUD to happen in single family or, or, or two family uh, districts. I think that one of the advantages, as I've said before, uh, for us in that case is that when we have these small lot divisions that are trying to fit in, we are dividing them without knowing what will happen. And if we had a process that would allow the PUD to apply there, we could actually define it tied to a development and not just to a land division. So I, I don't think this is, um, I, I don't think this is scary at all. I think this is a reasonable approach. Um, I think we're going to find that there are some uh, some context issues that that we may not have imagined. But as a city, we have the ability to not grant a PUD if we don't like what's happening. Other comments? Um, I'm just trying to, I'm looking at this. Where you say it's 26%. So you're saying of the whole site, this is 26% of that. And it just doesn't, it looks like it's more than that to me, but that could just be me. 
I guess I'm just trying to make sure that the 50 percent, or what, you know, like you were saying, whatever percentage is the right one to go with. So, so that's 26. So those single-family lots are 26 percent. 26 percent of the overall acreage, right? Thank you. Other comments or questions? All right, hearing none, we'll close that topic. And um, when does that come before council? Uh, that'll it'll come before the planning commission for a public hearing on May 14th. Oh, back to us first. Correct. Thank you, okay. Thank you, Planner Teague. Uh, moving on then uh, in reports and recommendations, our uh, tree ordinance discussion is back. It will uh, go to City Council on May 6th uh, to be presented by Commissioner Platter. He and Commissioner Carr have uh, put in some great work on this and um, had conversations with folks from other commissions as well. And I think, um, Commissioner Carr, if we could just get a brief recap from you. Yes, uh, as you recall, in the previous meetings, we did approve, excuse me? Uh, you know, I'm not, we're not going to do the presentation. I think that it's been sent out, unless there was a need for it. Um, as you recall, the Planning Commission did a, uh, a uh, move to uh, recommend the tree ordinance, tree protection ordinance, to the City Council, and that's going uh, to the City Council on May 6th. Uh, in preparation for that meeting, uh, Commissioner Platter and myself prepared a uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation which gives some background on, on why this tree ordinance is being proposed and you've received a copy of that, I believe electronically as well as in your packet today. So I wanted to ask you um, if anyone had any questions about that. I also wanted us just to consider the fact that the uh, Energy and Environment Commission, a member of that commission, had written to the Planning Commission indicating that the work that they had done, which was the Urban Task Force, had different findings than our residential uh, working group did on the Planning Commission side, and that they felt that uh, tree removal was not an issue uh, in redevelopment. And they were also concerned about the uh, city forester, uh, that position, and, and, and being involved in, in approving uh, the landscape plans. So th there were no detailed comments from that commission on the ordinance itself. But again, their findings were different than our findings as far as tree removal being an issue. Uh, and I, I'm hoping I'm stating uh, their position correctly. Uh, they also indicated that they thought that if it was an issue, it applied only to the smaller lots, 75 feet and under. And so I just wanted to um, mention that if anyone has any comments on that issue, I think that would benefit Commissioner Platter and myself as we present this to the City Council. Um, Commissioner Platter is actually going to be making the presentation, and I will suggest to him that he uh, bring to the City Council's attention this com the comments that we've received from the Energy and Environment Commission and uh, w why we think that the tree ordinance is, is important. It's limited to redevelopment. It's limited to uh, teardowns, redevelopment, where there are some trees removed and there's replacement required. And then also the tree ordinance requires protection of trees during construction and also, um, again, uh, replacement of trees that are removed and a landscape plan. Those are the three key elements of it. So I would just ask other commissioners to comment if they have any comments or questions. Any questions? Commissioner Forrest. Um, was that an official statement of, by the Energy Environment Commission that they do not recommend a tree ordinance or is that the interpretation of previous findings by one of their members? Well, it's not completely clear to me. Uh, we did take a look at some of their minutes of their meetings uh, of the Energy and Environment Commission. At one point in time, they actually did recommend that the tree protection ordinance go to the Planning Commission uh, for development, and which, which happened. Uh, it was brought up at their last, I believe it was their, one of their last meetings, recent meetings, 
where they did talk about the tree protection ordinance and the fact that there be, seemed to be some disconnect as to findings that their urban task force uh, study did not, they did not come back with any feedback that this was an issue and that's contrary to the uh, residential working group on the planning commission. But other than that, I, I was not able to see any official stance that was taken by the commission. And Carrie, is that correct in your interpretation of their uh, meeting minutes? That would be my interpretation as well. Yeah, it, it doesn't look like there was a clear vote, um, but they did find that it was contrary to that to that document. Thanks. I've just got two comments on, on that. I think one, there was a comment, uh, a statement about removing a, a mature tree being a cost prohibitive sort of thing and that uh, with the implication that that's a deterrent in itself and I think um, I, I don't agree with that I think if you're building a, a million dollar house on a lot and you've got a mature tree in the way that's um, not going to keep you from building the house you want so something to take into consideration and then um, one aspect of, of this email that I appreciated was the the call for a natural resource manager to take a more integrated look at some of the env environmental issues associated with development rather than splitting them up between uh, areas of expertise like a tree specialist. I thought that was a, a, a positive comment. Um, having said that, I, uh, personally, I, I support the work that Commissioner Platter and Commissioner Carr have done. I think it's good and look forward to the uh, council meeting presentation. Any other comments? Commissioner Kilberg. Um, I would have to agree and say that I also agree with the findings that we have found as a planning commission as well as the residential work group. Um, I feel that if our residents have come to us and provided public input saying that they're concerned about their trees during construction, they're concerned about their, how their neighbor's construction affects their trees, how their overall tree canopy in their area um, and the overall tree canopy in the city of Edina, I feel like that's enough to justify what we have come up with here even though it may not be concurrent with some of the findings that have previously gone on with the urban task force and such. So I would also just kind of highlight that it is, we have seen a residential need and I feel like that justifies enough of the need for the ordinance here. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, I just wanted to talk about the um, small area plan process for Valley View and Wooddale. Commissioner Platteter is unable to continue on that um, as one of the planning commissioner representatives for that planning team and Commissioner Lee is very graciously offered to step in so I'm that should work out very well the process as was presented a few meetings ago we were hoping to have a kickoff at the end of this month early May at this point that's going to be delayed until in June so if anybody's watching is wondering where's this kickoff meeting for the community regarding the small area plan in that area that's what's going on however we do hope to keep a, the timeline rather close to what we were anticipating before when things pick up in the fall so we'll gather um, preliminary information from the community in June uh, select a planning team in other words just representatives to administrate it it's not it's um, these are people to ensure that we get the feedback we, we need from residents from business people or whatever and then uh, there'll probably be a consultant involved and a um, will go forward then with more community input in the fall do you have any right. can, anything else to add from that just that the timeline was roughly about eight to nine months total so that was our goal to stay pretty tight to that and and keep to that uh, the, the goal is to ultimately have a small area plan that the council can review and we're looking at this as a prototype for how we would address similar uh, small area plan um, in the future. So we're kind of using it as a test case, so we're being more deliberate about each step and how long it should take, hopefully, and who the stakeholders or who would be involved as part of the planning team. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Forrest, and thank you, Commissioner Lee, for joining the team. Any other commission comments? I've, we've slipped into that portion of the meeting, I think. Mm -hmm. I've lost control. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, we, we do have our, our attendance sheet that was uh, part of this. I think we've got that up to date. Um, Jackie, one thing I wanted to ask you is if you could double check our, uh, the column with term dates on this. I think that might need a little updating. Yes. One or two spots. Other than that, it, we're, we're running our percentages appropriately now. Uh, any other commission comments? Commissioner Carr. Just to keep us on task, um, I don't know if next meeting, uh, well, well, whether there will be time or not to discuss the work agenda. I think, is that on the, is that on our agenda, you know, our working agenda for the year, our goals and objectives for the year? I don't know how f frequently that comes to the Planning Commission, but it seems like it's been a few sessions. And I would like to just have that put on the agenda for next meeting, if we could. Good idea. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Anyone else? Yes, Commissioner Carr. I was wondering if there was a council, was there a council update in this package? Oh, there was not. Meeting was, was last night, so. Any staff comments? This uh, there were. There was one item on the council agenda from the Planning Commission, and that was the final plat of the Wyman Place edition. You recall that's that three-lot subdivision um, by the Wyman Bridge, 63rd, and Warren. And so that, that was approved. So there'll be, we may see some construction out there this summer. Thank you, Planner Teague. All right, we've run through our agenda. I would take a motion for adjournment. <laughs> Second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>